Bernard, Bernard, and I see also McKinley and Gary and Karen was here earlier. David. Wow, we've got a good good group to start with. Very good. Well, uh, I'm glad you've all come to hear about hell and heaven. <laughs> I, uh, Forrest keeps reminding me that we're going to talk about heaven as well as hell, but I think hell's maybe more interesting for this for this discussion. So um, let me begin by thanking Forrest and Barbara for, in general, being really supportive of the Sabbath School over the years. And uh, they are people who are always there and just see what needs to be done and do it. And I very, very much appreciate that, Forrest and Barbara. I also particularly am thankful to Forrest for taking on this assignment. Forrest spotted this book before it was published, I think, and was waiting for it to be published and was looking forward to it. Uh, like the couples, uh, Forrest is also um, a person who's read quite a bit of Bart Ehrman over the years and has found that to be helpful. I don't know if you're going to say much about Bart Ehrman's life, Forrest, and his, his spiritual journey. I am. Okay, good. So I won't go to that. He's a very, Bart Ehrman has a very colorful and I think uh, instructive life story to share with us. And this particular book is right out of his own life. So on the one hand, he's a very well-respected and well-read New Testament scholar, but he combines that with his own spiritual pilgrimage in ways that many people have found helpful. So I see the Capitos are here too. So everybody, Sabates, Sabates are here. Okay, let's, let's begin with prayer. Um, you know, somewhere along the line for us, I don't know. I lost you. Where are you? I'm here. Oh, there. Sometime we might break this group down into small groups, even for five minutes, just to see how that goes. Uh, we can have it, the, uh, hi Nathan, the um, machine here or Zoom will automatically put us into groups. So it might be fun to get into groups of three or four people and get a little more acquainted with each other for just a few moments. Hi Judy, welcome. Okay, so let's, um, any comments before we get started? Okay, after we get started, I will mute everybody. And that means if you want to speak, you just hold down the space bar on your keyboard. And it's, hi, Ron. As long as you're holding it down, you can speak. When you're done speaking, uh, just um, <coughs> release it, and then it will go back to mute. And that way we can keep the background noise to a minimum. Okay, let's begin with prayer. Dear God, again, we are thankful for the Sabbath. We're particularly thankful that we can celebrate it in this unusual way under these difficult times. We are thankful for those who were responsive enough to your influence to come up with these wonderful, wonderful technologies that help us to communicate with each other. Thank you for these people here who are gathered and thank you for Forrest and Barbara for all their help and presence and thank you for Forrest who's been hard at work on this series and we will learn from him today in Christ's name amen oh. Okay, everybody is muted, I think, and so off you go, Forrest. Okay, thank you very much, David. Um, the whole world is changing now with Zoom and WebEx, and I can't think of the other ones, but on Thursday, I was on three different virtual meetings, so uh, I tried to get mileage for one of them, but they said no, so they I wouldn't have to do that. So this is getting to be the new technology, Classes are being taught. 
And so this is my first uh, adventure in actually trying to teach or give a lecture. I, we do have a group on Friday morning that gets together on Zoom and we have a good chat. And I think a couple of my boys are on today, so I have to be careful what I say, because uh, uh, I told them if they came on, they would get extra points toward, towards my will. And so uh, anyway, I appreciate that. Anyway, so we want to talk about uh, uh, a topic that sometimes we don't like to talk about, but it's been with history for a long time. But before we actually get into the topic, I do want to introduce you to Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman uh, is currently James uh, Gray Distinguished Professor at the University of Carol North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Uh, he's written well over 30 books. Uh, I have read quite a few of them. I was introduced to him about probably 15, don't think it was quite 20 years ago yet, by a friend of mine who introduced me to the teaching company. Uh, if, if you don't know about the teaching company, uh, uh, look that up sometime because there's some really good classes on there. Anyway, Bart Ehrman um, uh, was, was born into a Christian family, Episcopal family in Kansas. And when he was a, a teenager, he made the commitment to Christ and became involved with uh, a, a, a youth group, Young Life, there at his local school. And when he graduated from high school, he went to Moody Bible Institute, and where he was planning to go and win the world for, for Jesus to keep people out of hell. And so he studied for, I think that's, uh, two years at M Moody, and then he went on over to uh, Wheaton College, where he studied uh, Greek and Hebrew and Latin, and prepared himself so he could teach a Bible. Uh, at, when he graduated from Wheaton, he then moved way across, uh, theologically, from Wheaton and Moody Bible Institute, to Princeton Theological Seminary, where he studied under Bruce Metzger, who is now deceased, but was a world-renowned scholar in the area of manuscripts, New Testament manuscripts. Anyway, after graduating from Princeton Theological Seminary, he, he pastored for a while, but during that time, he was shifting in from a very conservative position, a fundamentalist position, to a much more of a liberal Christian and after he accepted the position at the University of North Carolina, he actually has given up his faith. He considers himself an agnostic, but I find him very cordial to religious peoples. He doesn't want to argue and, and try to convince people out of the faith. I find him very uh, understanding of other positions. Uh, so I think He's somebody that you may disagree with, and I disagree with him in a lot of things, even though I have read many of his articles, and I do belong to his blog. I've been there for about seven years, and so uh, I find him very interesting, and even though I may not agree with his uh, overall theological positions, I do find him a good scholar and one who's very humble and willing to change his opinion quite often. So... Um, and the latest book that he has written, and yes, I ordered it before it was um, uh, even out. I got a heaven and hell. So remember, we're doing both heaven and hell. Uh, and so uh, I pre ordered the book and then started to read it as soon as I got it. I recommend the book. Uh, we'll talk about it uh, a little bit more as we go along. Well, a lot more as we go along. I think, though, it's it's good to, to know that there are people uh, who are good scholars, and that's one of the things I do like about him. He takes complex issues and makes them quite uh, easy for, for lay people to understand. And so even though sometimes scholars will say, well, this has been in the scholarly community for years, uh, it hadn't reached out into the layperson, into the uh, into the pew. So 
So I, again, I think he's got 30 books out plus scholarly articles. I personally have a, an interest in this topic. Uh, the first 12 years of my life, we attended a Methodist church in central Michigan, which I, when I go back to on occasion, I, I go to the, the, the Methodist church that, that I attended. And fortunately, I don't remember too much about hell being taught, but my mother who was raised in a very conservative Methodist background said that she used to wake up in the middle of the night with the devil chasing her with a pitchfork. And so when she became an Adventist, she was very relieved to know uh, that there was no devil chasing her with a pitchfork. I also have found this topic of interest in a couple other ways. One is when I first started out in the ministry and was involved with evangelism a lot, I found that people would keep coming to church, uh, I mean, to, um, to our evangelistic meetings when you get through the Sabbath, uh, things like that. But when you came to the topic of hell, they dropped off. There was something about not having a hell which people did not like. And so I, I find that this is a very interesting topic in that sense. It seems to impact people in a very distinct way. I also have a particular interest in this topic because I did work with Campus Crusade for Christ for a year. And while I was there, they changed their doctrinal statement. And their doctrinal statement included an everlasting burning continual hell that you had to sign. And I remember for about a year working with Bill Bright and some of the others and the other Adventists that were on the staff trying to get Campus Crusade for Christ not to include a doctrinal statement to include hell, uh, but they felt that it was necessary. And so as a result of that, I left Campus Crusade for Christ and ended up in Michigan, back in Michigan, but in, at Andrews, where I met uh, Dr. W.G.Z. Murdoch and told him I was thinking about coming to the seminary. And I still remember him. He says, well, laddie, he says, all you have to do is make up your Greek. I, I, I can't do it like he does, but he could talk without moving his teeth. Uh, with a nice Scottish accent. So I spent the next three years uh, studying at Andrews, met my, my wife there, and so my life has been different as a result of uh, going to Andrews. But I may not have been going to Andrews if uh, the topic of hell had not come up. So as I said, this has been a very uh, important topic uh, in my life, uh, uh, in instrumental in some certain changes, well, one other thing, I, um, I've, had, I've come into contact with Christians. I have one person in mind, his name is Tom, and he worked with me when I worked for the American Bible Society. And one day he told me his grandmother had passed away and he was just really in torment. Well, I said, what's the matter? He said, she was not a Christian and I feel that she's in hell burning right now. And so, you know, I feel sorry uh, for people who have an understanding that causes them such tor uh, uh, torment like that. Anyway, so let's talk more about the book and then we can, uh, we'll have a video here in a, in a few moments, but uh, from, from Dr. Ehrman. But the fear of death has been among us for as long as we have had human records. From history's oldest surviving tale, the epic of Gilgamesh, to the new final season of The Good Place. I haven't seen The Good Place, but I understand it's a very interesting uh, TV series. Soon to enter its own eternal rest. The views of these two cultural artifacts are widely different, wildly different, but they share a constant. The eponymous hero of the Mesopotamian epic rises in agony at the prospect of spending eternity groveling in the dust, being eaten by worms. Eleanor Shellstrop of The Good Place 
desperately works to avoid the afterlife she deserves in the bad place and its eternal torments. Today, few people may share the Gilgamesh actual concern of being conscious forever in the dirt. Plenty, however, tremble with morbid fear before eternal nothingness, entering the void with no hope of return. Yet others cannot stand the uncertainties of the unknown, unsure of what will happen, pleasant and painful, or oblivious to both. But the majority of Americans continue to anticipate some version or another of the afterlife, like the good place. 70, according to the Pew uh, Research Center, 72% of Americans continue to believe in a literal heaven and 58% in a literal hell. Even for those who think most people will avoid the uh, torture chambers of the underworld, some will go there, and how can anyone be sure that they will not make the cut? As it, turn, as it turns out, that's not true. And the idea that a person dies and goes to heaven for eternal reward or hell for eternal uh, everlasting punishment is never taught in the Old Testament. Even more surprising is not what Jesus himself taught or of his earliest followers. So at this time, David, would you... Uh, uh, start the video on uh, with Dr. Ehrman. I just want to mention: don't watch the lips of the presenters because we're you're not going to be in sync. But uh, but watch uh, but watch the uh, PowerPoint and listen to it. So uh, David, if you'll start that at that time. Yeah, one second here. Um. I can't quite reach the... Just click on the screen, see what happens. So we begin uh, at the beginning uh, with our oldest uh, literature. Uh, our oldest literature in the Western tradition is uh, Homer, uh, Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey, where we have a portrayal of the afterlife in uh, a place that he calls Hades. It is a striking portrayal uh, because it's the place that uh, everybody goes uh, when they die. A person's uh, body dies, their, uh, their shade or their shadow uh, goes down to dwell in this place called Hades. It, uh, it's an interesting place. We see it uh, for fan because Odysseus in the Odyssey actually goes there and uh, has conversations with his brother and with some of his former colleagues. Uh, and uh, so we get a sense for what it's like, and it's not good. Uh, the uh, people down there are called shades or shadows, and they have just about just about as much uh, strength and intelligence as your shadow. Uh, they are they are literally shades, and uh, none of them is happy to be in there. And there is virtually nothing to do there, and there is no joy there, and it's going to go on like that forever. And uh, everybody just wishes they were back. Alive again. There's a corollary to that in the oldest Israelite uh, writings found in the Hebrew Bible. The Hebrew Bible does not describe Hades the way uh, the, the Greeks do. Uh, in the Hebrew Bible, the main uh, designation for what happens to a person when, uh, when they die is that they go to death. Uh, death is used over a thousand times in the Hebrew Bible, or commonly known. Uh, but less frequently mentioned is a place called Sheol. Uh, Sheol is sometimes thought of as being a kind of uh, Israelite form of Hades, but that's probably a misconception. Uh, it looks like in the Hebrew Bible, when Sheol is talked about, and it's only mentioned about the same time, that Sheol is actually a synonym for the grave, or the pit. In other words, it's the place that a person's body is deposited after the person dies. Uh, ancient Israelite thought did not conceptualize a soul that was distinct from the body. For ancient Israelites, the soul and the body are, are one thing. They're not uh, two separate things that can exist independently. And so a person is alive only when the body has soul within it. But when the soul leaves, uh, not only is the body dead, but the soul doesn't exist either. It's probably most analogous to what we think of as the breath. Uh, the breath, uh, when, when a person stops breathing, uh, when they die, the breath doesn't go anywhere for us. And that's kind of like 
right. Uh, when ancient Israelites thought about the, what we might call the soul, uh, it's, it's the life force that leaves and, and the bunch person dies, they're dead. Uh, and they go to the grave. And that's the end of the story. And so the uh, problem of Sheol is not a place. It is really rather a, uh, it's simply the grave that you're in where there's nothing happening because you are dead. Uh, and so it's not really life after death, it's death after death. There's an obvious problem with both of these views of Hades and Sheol, which is, where's the justice? If, if, if there's a God in the world or gods in the world, uh, why, why is it the people who do what's right and who are moral and who are good, uh, they have the same fate as people who are absolute schmucks? I mean, surely uh, there's got to be some kind of justice in the world. This problem of justice led to different points of view in both Greek and uh, Israelite circles. Eternal justice. In Greek circles, several hundred years after Homer, we have the writings of Plato. Uh, Plato, probably the uh, most important philosopher in uh, Western history, uh, talked a good deal about souls and about how souls cannot die. Uh, Plato taught the immortality of the soul. In some of the stories that he tells, uh, myths or stories, uh, he, he talks about what happens to souls after, their, after a person dies. The person's body disappears, it disintegrates, but the soul lives on. But what happens to the soul? Uh, in Plato's myths, there are two major places that, uh, that souls go to. They either go to Tartarus or they go to Elysium. Tartarus is what we would think of as hell. Uh, it's a place of torment. That's for people who are wicked. People who go to Elysium, uh, those are, uh, that would be comparable to uh, what we think of as heaven. It's a place of great blessing and happiness forever and ever. And so people uh, can choose uh, which place to go to, and uh, their, their life, the eternal life of the soul, depends upon it. It's interesting that um, those views about uh, torture forever or happiness forever are not found anywhere in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, this was not an Israelite view. But eventually, toward the very end of the uh, Hebrew Bible, Israelites did develop an idea that there would be eternal justice. Since, though, Jews did not believe that the soul could separate from the body, they didn't have the idea that the body died and the soul would go to heaven or hell. Most Jews who came up with any idea of an afterlife at all thought that what would happen is, at the end of time, when justice was going to be done, when God had had enough of this wicked world and was ready to save it, he would uh, he would destroy the forces of evil. He would make the world entirely good the way he had planned it when he made paradise in the beginning. Paradise, Garden of Eden, originally was here on earth. And for people who believe in the future, future justice among Jews, paradise is returning to earth. And people will enter into it bodily. Those who are alive when this new event happened, when God's kingdom came to earth, as opposed to the wretched kingdom ruling now, when this kingdom of God arrived, people would enter into it, who were alive at the time, Okay, I don't know what's happened here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, you folks stay on board, okay? Don't back out. I'm going to back out and uh, try again. So, but if you stay on board, the meeting, the meeting won't end. Okay?
I have a question while we're waiting. Bernard, uh, is, is Urban right about the Old Testament and his uh, statements? Can you hear me? <laughs> uh, yeah, I can hear you. Um, I'm, I don't hear real well. Um, and I'm also um, contemplating um, in my mind uh, where I might fit what he's saying. So I'm not in a position to offer a definitive view, but um, certainly not a perspective with, with which I'm familiar, which perhaps will go most of the way to answering your question. Thank you. I guess my question is, is he correct that the Old Testament, nowhere in the earth, what he's calling the Hebrew Bible, uh, uh, are there any intimations or references to what uh, an eternal life or eternal death? Uh, and I'm assuming he is correct, but I'm just asking you for affirmation. Yes, yes, okay, I understand, uh, I got your question now. Yes, yes, that is, is correct. Uh, bodily resurrection uh, at the earliest is in the book of Daniel, chapter 12. Uh, and um, so uh, these were ideas that um, did not arise until the Israelite religion in captivity interfaced with the uh, the Persian world and and uh, and that's that sort of situation, which awakened to them opportunities which they had not realised were already in essence part of their religion, but they had no occasion to activate it. Thank you. That makes me feel better about Ehrman. David. You have to oh, unmute yourself, David. Can you hear me? I can hear you now, David. Okay, now let me try to get the uh, share screen going back again, all right? Okay. Huh. <clears throat> Well, I'm going, I don't know why uh, this is not working now, but we can hear each other, but the share screen is not coming up, correct? That's correct. I, we can, um, I can go on from here. Okay. Um, all right. Go ahead and I'll see what I can do here. I got to, got to find, I can't. I'm not quite sure where.
We're on your screen, David. Um, boy. Oh, my. Okay, now I see you, Forrest. Can you see? Uh... I can see everybody now. Okay. So now right. let me try to share screen. Okay. Um, okay, I, I know what the problem is, but go ahead, all right? Okay. Uh, if you folks stay there, even if I leave, it shouldn't be a problem. So go ahead, and I know what happened. I'll try to fix it. Okay, well, thank you, David. Um, all this technology is great, but sometimes we uh, run into things that we didn't know we had before. So anyway, uh, yeah, so the discussion that has come up to this point with, or, or as Airman is saying, that in the Old Testament, there is uh, no comment, no, uh, belief in the in the afterlife you you go to you die you go to sheol and there you stay and i think the the, the best example of of that is in the book of ecclesiastes where you the living know that they shall die but the dead know nothing and of course we've used that as a proof text since adventist evangelism to prove soul sleep but if you really look at that text it's not very encouraging at all now, of course, the Old Testament does not speak with just one voice on this topic. Uh, there are 39 different uh, books in the Old Testament. But you find out basically that after death is only death. Uh, I think David is trying to get back on now. Oops. I'm just going to pause here. This was a presentation uh, for the folks from Texas that uh, been reading Airman's book. You can pick these up um, on Oxford University Press Vimeo. Any luck yet, David? Am I unmuted? He's no, unmuted. he is. Okay. In the book of Ecclesiastic, the idea is to live your life now and to enjoy it while you can. It was only later on, oh, here we go. Is it Leah again? Yeah. But he, David, you're muted. See, he is sharing a screen, so therefore I've got a little. Can anybody hear him talking? No, I can't hear it, David. David, you got, you're on mute. No, I can't hear him. We're trying to get 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 this thing so we can hear it. I just I think the uh, host cannot be muted. Forrest, I just went up. You know, when he's changing things, it automatically mutes it, and it, he didn't know. So I just ran up and told him. He came down here and looked what was happening on mine. So he's just gone back. Yeah, the host host can't mute. Uh, 
But he wasn't muting. It ha oh. it kept happening from something else. Oh, okay. Yeah, and the pictures on your family aren't there. Just the text. Yeah, because they have Android users. Oh, there. I see. So, um, I cannot believe, I don't understand what, let me see your phone. And this is, this is for the Piston family. Correct. Yes, David. I can't control that's his screen. Oh. Okay. Uh, so is that one of the questions? Yeah. So you want to say sprouts, rose, comma. Can you hear me, Forrest? I can hear you. Okay, let's try again. <laughs> I, you know what happened is I was asked to, well, what's, this is what's happened. The chat uh, function wasn't working, and so I tried to fix that, and in trying to fix the chat function, I have uh, messed all the rest of this up. That's, that's what's happened. So, of uh, course, I'm going to ask you to keep going, and I'll see if I can get back on, okay? Okay, all right. So, we, we get through the time of, uh, of the Hebrews, where they, uh, 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 when you die, you die. But so, where does the concept of, of uh, hell and an afterlife come in? Well, first of all, if you, again, as has been mentioned, uh, in the book of Daniel, in the, chap the 12th chapter in the Hebrew Bible, there is discussion of the afterlife. And that's the introduction to the concept of called apocalypticism. And there's a whole genre of literature dealing with uh, the apocalypt uh, of apocalypticism. I have a hard time saying that word. Uh, anyway, uh, Daniel is an example of that. Now, the one thing that we disagree probably with, uh, I mean, we Adventists would disagree with the, the time of, of uh, I'm going to hand it over to Bart. Uh, Bart, why don't you go ahead and get started. Okay, you're Zoom. getting the sound on Bart. It didn't happen soon, and it didn't happen later, and it never happened. So what does that do? Sorry. And it's better than the current chat function. Sorry. 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 Capable of turning anything I say. The great uh, ideas of having the hell are not. I think you need to move everybody. That didn't die, and your soul goes to one place or another. I'm calling the final slide the Christian amalgam. The historical Jesus was a Jew of this day who believed, like many Jews of this day, that God was soon going to intervene in history to overthrow the powers of the people and bring in a good kingdom on earth. When Jesus talked about the coming kingdom of God, he was not talking about what people today seem to think of when they think of the kingdom of God. Today, when, when people normally read the Bible and they hear the kingdom of God, they think about heaven up above. That, that what's coming is, I'm going to die, and my soul is going to go to heaven. Jesus didn't think that. Jesus believed in the future bodily resurrection, not in the immortality of the soul. The kingdom of God is the kingdom that God is going to bring here on earth. In other words, it's going to be the place where God rules here on earth, where there'll be no more sin, there'll be no more suffering, no more misery, no more death. This will be an eternal kingdom, and the people who follow God 
principally by following the way Jesus is interpreting the law of God, those people will enter in to the kingdom of God. Those who uh, are uh, not alive at the time will be raised from the dead. Jesus taught that those who were righteous would be brought into that kingdom. Those who were unrighteous would be destroyed. This is one of the key themes of my, of my new book, that Jesus did not believe in eternal torment. Jesus did not believe in a hell in the sense of a place that your soul goes to be uh, tortured forever. Jesus thought that at the end, everybody would be raised. Some would enter into the perfect kingdom for paradise forever. Others would be annihilated. The, uh, the punishment for being wicked is the death sentence. A permanent death sentence. So it's an eternal punishment because it is never going to end. You will always be annihilated. Several years after Jesus, the Apostle Paul was converted to become a follower of Jesus. Paul, before he became a follower of Jesus, was himself a Jew who believed in the coming uh, apocalypse, the coming of the kingdom of God, where God would destroy the forces of evil and bring in a good kingdom. When he became a follower of Jesus, Paul came to think that Jesus himself would be bringing the kingdom. He would be the ruler of this kingdom. He's up now, dwelling with God, but he's going to come back down and establish the kingdom on earth. And in Paul's earliest writings, he appears to think this is going to happen within his own lifetime. He will be alive when Jesus returns and establishes God's kingdom. But once again, there was a problem with the interim. Because even though Paul thought that early on in his ministry, the end did not come right away. And Paul's ministry dragged on year after year, and then after some decades, and Paul started thinking, maybe I'm going to die before this happens. And Paul wondered, well, what, what then? What happens if I die before the coming of Jesus? The end never came, and this forced Paul to rethink a few things, and other people as well. Paul came to think that since he already now, while he's alive, has a close relationship with Christ, he is one with Christ. Christ is a Here on earth, where there'll be no more sin, there'll be no more suffering, no more misery, no more death. This will be an eternal kingdom, and the people who follow God, uh, principally by following the way Jesus is interpreting the law of God, those people will enter in to the kingdom of God. Those who uh, are uh, not alive at the time will be raised from the dead. Jesus taught that those who are righteous would be brought into that kingdom. Those who were unrighteous would be destroyed. This is one of the key themes of my, of my new book, that Jesus did not believe in eternal torment. Jesus did not believe in a hell in the sense of a place that your soul goes to be uh, tortured forever. Jesus thought that at the end, everybody would be raised. Some would enter into the perfect kingdom for paradise forever. Others would be annihilated. The uh, the punishment for being wicked is the death sentence, a permanent death sentence. So it's an eternal punishment because it is never going to end. You will always be annihilated. Several years after Jesus, the apostle. What happens if I die before the coming of Jesus? The end never came, and this forced Paul to rethink a few things, and other people as well. Paul came to think that since he already now, while he's alive, has a close relationship with Christ, he is one with Christ. Christ is in his life, and he is in Christ's life. They are, they are united in some way. Paul came to think that when he died, that was not going to end. 
He was not going to die and then be in his grave for a while, maybe a year or two or a century or two. He's not going to be dead without being in Christ's presence. Paul came to think that, in fact, he was going to go into the presence of Christ immediately at death, and that appears to be his view in his later writings, such as in, uh, in, in uh, Second Corinthians, for example, or in the book of Philippians. Most of Paul's converts, by, uh, by the end of his life, uh, actually throughout his entire life, but most of the converts actually to Christianity by the end of Paul's life, most of them came from Gentile uh, background rather than Jewish. These converts did not bring the, uh, the uh, Jewish view of the afterlife into their Christian faith. They never had the Jewish view before they converted. Most of them bought a Gentile view, in other words, a Greek view. These Gentiles courted on quite easily to what Paul said that at death he would be in the presence of Christ. And so what ends up happening is that Christians who are and raised and brought up in Greek ways of thinking come into the Christian faith that didn't have a, uh, a Greek understanding of Tartarus and Elysium, the medium of Tartarus. Uh, the end that they were expecting didn't come. They came to think that in fact what's going to happen is when they die is when the end is going to come. And since these people came from Greek backgrounds, they tended to think that it meant that their soul would live on. And in Greek circles, souls never die. And so just as Paul thought that when he died, he would be in the presence of Christ, his followers thought that when they died, they'd be in the presence of Christ. In other words, they would go up to where God lives. But what about those who were not righteous? What about those who were wicked? and sinful, and those who rejected that Christ was the Savior. Well, they obviously weren't going to go to heaven, but they had souls, and their souls uh, their souls would have to go somewhere. And so Christians adopted the idea that there was also a place of punishment after death. The soul cannot die, and so it will be either rewarded or it will be punished, and so there is now heaven and hell. I'm calling it the Christian amalgam, because it's the teaching, taking in rough terms the teaching of Plato of the immortality of the soul with the least in Tartarus, and the teaching of Jesus that God is soon going to intervene, and faith in the Christian God is what's going to determine what happens after death, and has put those two views together so that now you have a view that's neither the view of Plato nor the view of Jesus, the idea that it's death, heaven, and hell are the destiny of souls. So once again, it leads to a problem. The problem in this case is that hell is forever because souls cannot die. Is that really justice? Is it fair that a person sins for, say, 30 years before they die, and then they get tortured in hell for 30 trillion years, and that's the beginning? Uh, that doesn't seem fair. And so Christians started developing other ideas. Uh, I talk about these uh, in my book. Some Christians have an idea of reincarnation or you have a chance at it. Other Christians thought that at the end, God's will will be done, and at the end, everybody's going to convert, and so salvation will be universal. Both views continue to hang on today, as well as the traditional view that when a soul a person dies, their soul goes to heaven or hell. Okay, I'm going to stop there, and I will be happy to uh, take your questions. Hey, David. Yes? You want me to take it from here? Yeah, what do you see? I just, I see the screen of everybody. Do you, okay. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, if you don't mind, then how about doing that? I'll do that. that and I'll just uh, summarize, uh, summarize what, up to this point, and then we can go into discussion later. Okay. Yeah. I apologize to everybody. I myself made this mistake by trying to open up the chat while everything else was going on, and that has uh, created lots of problems. So go ahead. Thank you, Forrest. Well, thank you, David, and uh, appreciate the apologies, but uh, I think we probably would have all done something too like that. So, uh, But I thank, your, thank you for your good work on this. Let me just summarize what we got. Death has been an issue that people have been afraid of for years. And it goes back to the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, 
that uh, what happens after one dies uh, in the uh, in the early Hebrews, uh, death was death. You you died and you went to Sheol, and now that's translated in the Old Testament uh, by English uh, translators as hell, but it's not like hell or Hades in the Greek concept. But rather, it was you sleep. Uh, you you no longer uh, praise God. You no longer enjoy a good life. Your life is over. So the idea is enjoy life while you can. Now the Greeks uh, had a oh let me before I get to that and again and we're going to talk about that a little bit later on the um, in the Old Testament uh, in the book of Daniel chapter twelve. There's discussion about the afterlife. Now, Adventists have historically believed that Daniel was written probably in the 5th century. Ehrman and other scholars feel that it was written probably in the 2nd century. And I'm not going to get into that discussion so much, but we do know that the book of Daniel is a very late uh, uh, concept, uh, or late book in the, uh, in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, I believe parts of Daniel are in Aramaic. And so that would indicate a fairly recent vintage. The Greeks also had this issue of what happens to people when they die. Now Homer had said you just go into, into Hades and there you just kind of exist as a, a shade. Uh, you know, you, you didn't enjoy life. It was just kind of eternal boredom. But the issue of justice came forward in the sense that if everybody's going to go to the same place, what, what good does it do to live a, a righteous life? And so uh, through Plato, we get the idea of, of the soul and the body being separate. Uh, the body being that which ages, the soul which is perfect. One of the things I did learn in this, that the Greeks actually felt that the soul had substance to it. It was a very fine material, uh, better material than the body. And so it actually occupied space, it had mass. And so it could be tortured. And so Plato believed that uh, there was a place for people to go to be punished or to have eternal life in the sense of, of Elysium. If uh, another uh, book, uh, uh, another person in, uh, the time not too far before Jesus is Virgil, the poet in the, uh, his saga, the Aeneid, where Aeneas, the hero, goes to Hades, and there he meets his father and others. And there, certain people are put into torture. Others uh, eventually come back in, in a reincarnation. But the Greeks definitely believed in a separation of the body and the soul. So mentioning again about Daniel, the idea of rewards and punishments eventually found its way into Judaism, but not until the end of the Old Testament period. Oh, and coming up to the time of Jesus, Jesus was an apocalyptic, apocalyptic preacher. Uh, whatever one has in their Christology, Jesus was preaching an immediate end of this world. But it's important to remember that Jesus was not teaching about eternal punishing. And same way with uh, Paul. Now, the one thing that Ehrman uh, does talk about is towards the end of Paul's life, uh, Paul felt that Jesus would come very soon, but it didn't look like it was going to happen. So Paul started to wonder what was happening. And so you look at 2 Corinthians, you look at Philippians, and you can see that, that Paul kind of has some things that would indicate that when he died, he would be going to heaven or into the presence of Jesus. And as after Paul died and as the, uh, the church stayed, and Jesus didn't come, that view took on a much more of a, an important view. 
And so by the time of the second century, the, uh, the third century, it was believed that, the, and, they had, and because the church had become Greek, they took Plato's view of um, that some went to heaven, the others went to hell. And if the, if the soul is eternal, then you have the issue of uh, people in hell for eternity. And so the, the Airman points out through his book that it's uh, through this period uh, that Christians changed from, well, the Christian church changed from annihilation to that of uh, eternal torment, heaven and hell. No, not torment for heaven, but uh, those options. And so we come today here in America, 72% of, of Americans believe in uh, eternal uh, life in the sense of either in heaven or 58% believe in hell. I would like at this time, um, I guess to throw it open for question, uh, Dr. Taylor, could you respond a little more on that question that was asked you earlier about Ehrman and his view of the Old Testament on death? Dr. Taylor, you're still muted. Something else may override. I was um, holding down the space bar. Um, yeah, in the interim, I have taken advantages of some resources I have here. And it's interesting that um, Sheol is extensive in the Hebrew Bible. And uh, the standard translation, I didn't have time to look at them, but I looked at in all sorts of places is that Hades was the translation of Sheol in the Septuagint, the Greek translation made in the uh, third, second century uh, BC. And um, so with that equation firmly in the background and the Septuagint uh, uniformly the equivalent of our Old Testament for New Testament times, the, uh, the idea already lay readily at hand. And so it wasn't surprising that Christianity would eventually adopt that as it emerged into a wider world. Um, I'll leave it there for now, but, uh, and I hope that that will be helpful to you. Okay. Any uh, any other questions? I mean, this isn't a question uh, so much as it's a comment, and that is, as I listened to him uh, and listened to you, Forrest, I was struck by how remarkably, like a Seventh Day Adventist point of view, Bart Ehrman's uh, convictions on this matter have become. That is, he believes in the integration of the body and the soul. He believes that there is nothing that succeeds or um, lasts the, outlasts the death of the body. One thing he doesn't talk about is how Plato believed that the, the soul, excuse me, Plato believed that the soul existed before it entered the body. So it has a pre-bodily existence for a while it's in the body, and then it has a post-bodily existence. And... Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. So, uh, and so in the, main, in the meantime, between when the soul exists before the body and when the soul exists after the body, in that interlude, the soul is in the body and it's called a prison. Right? right. The body is a prison. And from it, one seeks to be free as soon as possible. Now, one can contrast that view of the body as the prison with the New Testament view of the body as the temple of the Holy Spirit. So you have, on the one hand, the idea that the, the body is a prison, and on the other hand, the body is a temple. And I did not hear 
Bart Ehrman developed that thought, that contrast very, uh, very much, did he, uh, for us? No. Uh, you know, he does bring up uh, uh, the issue that the Greeks, Plato, and by the way, I'm, I'm going to divert in a second here, but Plato does talk about the eternal soul. Uh, and which, and then when the church became primarily Greek, and Jesus hadn't come back, they, the the Greek believers took on this idea that uh, that the the righteous would go to a, to, to eternal um, uh, pleasure, but they had to do something with his soul, which had been bad. So it has to go someplace, uh, and so he does. Uh, Ehrman does discuss that a little more in his book, uh, but he sees the, the big issue why Christianity has accepted eternal torment and eternal bliss immediately at death is because of the switch to, to the, the, Greek, uh, the church being primarily Greek. One, one further thought on this, and that is for Plato, one never learns anything one remembers what one knew in one's pre-bodily existence. So education is not a matter of being informed. Education is a matter of being reminded. Uh, and the Socratic method is an attempt by way of questioning to elicit one's recollection of what one previously knew. So it's a different, it's a different way of thinking about education. But it it emphasizes how the soul is separate from the body and how it exists before the body and exists after the body. And so Socrates looks toward his death with a lot of, of, uh, of calm, right? He says, pay for this chicken that I need. Yeah. I owe some people some money on and don't worry about me and so forth. Meanwhile, Jesus is dying this agonizing death, just agonizing. You know, and you look at it, Socrates' death is more serene. Jesus is agonizing as he faces death, uh, and that's because Socrates didn't really, Socrates believed he really wasn't going to die, and Jesus thought he really was going to die. Well, I would just add to that, I, and one of the things that uh, I have a question that I would like to ask Ehrman is he seemed to indicate that Socrates had a little different concept of the soul uh, that when he died he would either just go into eternal sleep or he would go into the presence of the greats the homer the uh the other great uh historians and uh, intellectuals of of greek history uh, so i i see a little difference between what airman was talking about plato and what he was talking about socrates uh, so, he... no, I was struck by that as well because I thought that um, Socrates believed that he's going straight to paradise. However, the soul is going to go straight to paradise. However, one understands that, but I guess it is a twofold option after one dies, according to Socrates. One, uh, nine, one could go into total annihilation, or one could go into some kind of reconnection with the previous worthies. But in no case does one go into endless hell, endless torment for Socrates. That's correct. And I think that's an important uh, uh, issue for Socrates. He at least doesn't come across as e eternal torment. He, he takes the hemlock. And if you read in the Phaedo, you know, as he's dying, he's talking about his feet becoming numb, and his legs and his abdomen. And finally, he gives it up. Um, so there wasn't any concept of torture for him. Um, I, so the, I'm going to stick this to the gallery view so we can see if people raise their hands and want to talk. Uh, the other way, I can't see if anybody wants to talk. Anybody want to speak into this? Most people have their things muted still. So I, I have, this is McKinley, I have a comment and a question. Okay, go ahead. So I, I appreciate your sharing the summary of this book. Uh, I think the author gives a background as to how the Christian understanding of the state of the dead 
and the afterlife entered into conventional Christian thinking. But um, I think building on something that David said, I don't think he really shares anything new that people who are familiar with Adventist teaching on the topic, uh, at least in my experience, don't know. And that reminds me of an event I attended in Los Angeles uh, several months ago, where this renowned uh, brain surgeon uh, had done some research on how children grow up and how their upbringing uh, affects their uh, experiences in, in adult life. And I thought, you know, we learn about that in Sabbath school uh, all the time, that, you know, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. So that's my uh, thought about uh, what this gentleman has uh, done. My question is... Tisley, could I interrupt you just for a second, please? Yes. Are you saying, I, I didn't hear you quite, are you saying that Bart Herman's view is very is not as it, huh, how should i put this bart ehrman's view is not as close to an avenus view as i thought it was or are you agreeing with me that it's very close to an avenus view i'm agreeing with you that uh it is close to the adventist view okay okay so then my question is to dr taylor uh about uh, the comment um, that the thinking about the afterlife didn't start until Daniel. Now, I don't know the timelines of these different books in the Bible, so I don't know when Job was written and when Daniel was written. Um, but what would you have to say, uh, Dr. Taylor, about uh, Job 14 and uh, verse 14? If a man dies, shall he live again? Uh, all the days of my appointed time, I will wait till my change come. You will call and I will answer you. You will have a desire to the work of my hands or thine hands. Uh, well, <laughs> I have I have been uh, drawn into this conversation sort of a, as an <laughs> expert witness, but I didn't come here having prepared to be that. Um, however, I think you will find it helpful to look at these references in a modern translation. Uh, and um, there is, is, at the time of translation, there was in a, a certain amount of, of baggage that was part of their heritage. Uh, in a class I was teaching uh, this week on Wednesday, uh, it's interesting, the history of the Hebrew Bible and, and uh, what has been retained and, and brought along, and they were the product of their times. And of course, we have key verses which for us have not changed, and so we don't have occasion to, to look elsewhere. But um, another one, of course, in Job, I know that my Redeemer lives and... and uh, that is uh, so much of a favorite at uh, the time of funerals. Um, and, and while I'm here, um, what hasn't been addressed is the undying, pun intended, fascination of Protestant Christianity with the notion of the devil and uh, of eternal punishment as an integral part of their happiness in heaven. In essence, uh, at least the popular view of it is that the individuals can't be happy in heaven unless they know the wicked are being punished, which seems to anticipate some sort of level of torment at being in heaven, um, but it's better than, it's not bliss. And um, in relationship to Dave's point, uh, I think it, uh, it is much more widely accepted what uh, Eamon is saying, not because he said it, but because there has been this, this steady uh, growth and development in the understanding of the text, the ability to read what it says and what it meant. In, in, in general, a, a, a larger sphere in which to 
Uh, me, let's see. May I respond to McKinley? If somebody wants to jump in, please do. But uh, if you don't jump in, I'm going to talk, okay? So please jump in. Can you hear me? I can hear you, David. Yes. Okay. Uh, McKinley asks, what does, how does Bart Ehrman help deal with this passage in Daniel? And I think the answer is uh, Bart Ehrman dates Daniel so late that it also fits into the same time period where the other uh, expressions of life after death start to surface. So we tend to think of Daniel being written before, um, what is it, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And I think Bart Ehrman's view is that Daniel was written after that. And so Daniel is actually retrospective rather than prospective. And I must say that, I, and I'm willing to be corrected on this by Dr. Taylor, but I think it's the standard view these days that Daniel was written much later than we have thought it would be. And if it's written much later than we thought it would be, that puts the book of Daniel and its references to the future life at the same time they were otherwise emerging. Yes. Now that's that's not my answer, but that's, I think, Bart Ehrman's answer. I, I think you're, you're right, David, that that is Ehrman's answer. He, he dates the, the book of, um, of Daniel at, in the, mid, the middle of the second century BCE. I, I have a background noise here. So, so McKinley here again. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Oh, so, Dave, are you suggesting again that... Uh, Job or where does Job, where does the writing of Job fit within this timeline? You know, I'm getting way away from the world of philosophy, of religion, and ethics, and Bernard Taylor is sitting right there, and so I'm going to be really spooky. But Dave, Dave, this is Rodney. Can I maybe just make a comment on this? Sure. Can you can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Look, uh, my, my uh, understanding from. Uh, my uh, Hebrew authors that I'm reading is the material for the Job story is perhaps the oldest story in the Bible. I don't know when it started to be documented, but it could have been the earliest, one of the earliest books to be written. Uh, it could have stayed open for some time, but it is, uh, uh, it is considered by many Hebrew scholars to be the oldest story in the Bible. Um, the uh, Hebrew scholars that I read uh, when it comes to Daniel would agree with Ehrman uh, that it was still open into the second century uh, BC uh, and that it was one of the last four books to kind of be sealed even though they weren't technically sealed many of these books stayed open until the seventh and eighth century uh, AD uh, and were worked on from a theological point of view as grammar and and, uh, and, and words were, uh, were reworked so uh, I think you, we can assume there were centuries um, uh, between those two stories, between Daniel and, uh, and the book of Job. I, I think the other thing I'd comment on is that um, what I heard today and, and watching the video was really very unprovocative uh, to me, uh, um, other than the annoyance uh, that the Greeks and the Romans uh, messed with a good story. Uh, and I now have to go back and try and work through the fog of the stories as to what the translators really do. But it occurred to me that uh, Bart uh, was really provoked by his background being evangelical uh, Christian, and that if he was a Seventh-day Adventist, he may not have been provoked uh, into leaving uh, the Christian church. His wife, his family, his best friends are Christians. Uh, um, he was solo uh, in this move. But those things that provoked him uh, are things that wouldn't provoke a Seventh-day Adventist, uh, the issue of the soul, the, the issue of hell, uh, and a painful hell. And so the other thing that occurred to me is that uh, if he was Hebrew, uh, he probably still would be a Hebrew. Uh, I, I, I think he rebelled uh, partly because of uh, his initial orientation uh, to Christianity, uh, and uh, it was a messy, uh, untidy, and uh, the context of the times 
uh, um, mess things up for him and for a lot of Christians. So in my quest uh, to be better informed, I will read more of Bach, but I have to understand uh, the critical manuscripts and the translations that occurred in the uh, first uh, couple of centuries in the AD period and how they were influenced by the Hellenic Empire and the Romans. Well, okay. Uh, there's no doubt that Bart Ehrman's personality and pilgrimage gives his books a kind of edge that uh, they wouldn't otherwise have. And I think many people in the Society of Biblical Literature and American Academy of Religion are somewhat wistful because he's making a lot of money saying what scholars have known for a long time. Yes. So you're right. It isn't yes. very provocative if one knows what's been going on for a while, but he's putting it in a way that people can understand, and particularly those in his own fundamentalist background can understand. And he's really, he's really needling them uh, as hard as he can because he believes, and I would agree with him, that this idea of eternal hell is psychologically destructive. Uh, and I, was it Forrest who said that your mother or grandmother used to have these uh, bad dreams about the devil pursuing her and so forth? There have uh, literally, people have become psychotic, uh, being anxious about having to be punished forever. I mean, forever is a very, very long time. Now, yes, Bernard's point is takeaway. an interesting uh, one, and that is, and I, I'm driving here, I'm not just meandering around, I think I'm driving to something. Bernard's point is that there seems to be something amongst Protestants Bernard said, but maybe it's amongst human beings who want some proportional retribution. Mm -hmm. They're not satisfied if there's not proportional retribution. I see Donna. Let me just finish this up and then I'll get to Donna. The, um, but Adventists have uh, succumbed to that. Adventists believe that in the end, the wicked will slip into annihilation, but those who have been more wicked will burn longer before they're annihilated than those who are less wicked. I mean, that's part of the Adventist heritage. And so we haven't completely rid ourselves of the desire for uh, proportional uh, retribution. We have just said it won't last forever. But if you're Hitler, you're going to burn longer than if you're Bernard Taylor uh, and, and so forth and so on. And that's, that's part of the Adventist tradition and it's part of the concession to this idea of proportional retribution. I myself think it's a mistake. I think it was a, an attempt on the part of our forefathers and foremothers to say to those who did believe in proportional retribution that, well, we're not that different from you are. But then I want to ask you, you all, you know, second person plural, are you comfortable with the idea that Hitler will suffer no more than um, Mother Teresa if they're both lost? Donna, you're going to jump in. Uh, I was going to say a couple of things. First of all, thank you, Forrest, and, uh, and thanks, David. Despite the technical difficulties, I feel like I did learn something, in particular the the reverse of what I had previously thought, that is, the Greeks influenced uh, the Jews and the Christians rather than the other way around. Uh, secondly... Uh, of course, uh, Don, could you come a little closer to the mic because I'm having a hard time hearing okay. you. Yeah, I was just, I was just thanking Forrest and, uh, and, and Bart Ehrman, I guess, and you, that despite the technical difficulties, I feel like I did learn something about the history at least. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Don. Okay. Uh, the second thing is, um, I think, David, in response to the thing you've said most recently, I think we, we not only want suffering for uh, these very bad people in history, but we want a little suffering for ourselves also, because we know that we need to be 
purified. And I'm curious as to when the, so we, we need a little. So purgatory is, a, is such a nice uh, or somewhat nice middle point. You know, we don't have to suffer forever like the really bad folk, but we don't get to go straight to Elysium or the Christian version of of heaven uh, either. We, we, we're going to get fixed because we all know that we need to be fixed uh, more or less. And then uh, one might say uh, Hitler, maybe he's going to require a little more fixing, uh, maybe a lot more fixing. Uh, and so there's probably a special cubicle for, for him and Stalin and a few people like that. And the rest of us will, will just get uh, uh, you know, we'll burn a little, but not too much. Uh, I, you, you all know, because you've heard me say it before, that my father committed suicide, my biologic father. So he, mm. we were Catholics at the time, and he, and the theology was that he had gone straight away to, uh, to hell, and there he was, burning, and really bothered my mother. So I have the same, uh, I have the same background uh, for us that you had. And um, and she became an Adventist, and it was just wonderful. The doctrine of the state of the dead brought us right into the Adventist church, and maybe it's brought a lot of other people in as well, or at least once they got here, they were relieved to find to find that out. So I I whatever the the pluses and minuses <laughs> or the that we have in our theology, I think that because it says something about the nature of God, I that is important uh i would have to give us a, a pat on the uh, back uh, theologically uh, so thank you but i did david i'd like to respond to one of your your points about the uh, psychological impact of the doctrine of hell uh that great atheist himself richard dawkins says no one deserves to go to hell except those who teach children there is one um, and I would l be interested to know what impact uh, psychologically uh, has, this doctrine has had on children. As I said, I was spared from that. My mother was not. Uh, you know, my mother argued, I say argued, you know, tried to share this, uh, well, we call it truth, uh, with her mother. And... Her mother just would not accept it because of the rich man and Lazarus. What do you th what do you do with the rich man and Lazarus? She said, so she could never give it up. But my mother was relieved to know that uh, people were not burning, and that she didn't have to worry about Satan chasing her with a pitchfork. So I I don't know. And by the way, I don't remember who it was. Um, in one of the early fathers, it might have been Tertullian. Uh, he's he's the one that indicated that part of the joy of, of Christians living in heaven is knowing that their persecutors are being tortured in hell. Uh, and so I, uh, so I, that's an interesting concept. I never thought of that being joyful, but at least some of the early fathers did. Well, yes, and I, God's I, own joy is... Uh, sustained throughout all eternity by God's awareness of the shrieks of pain that the, the evil are endlessly enduring. And what does that do? It shows God's sovereign majesty, yes. uh, which is unable to be questioned for any reason whatsoever. So the creator of the universe needs to have people uh, in excruciating pain forever in order to feel good about God's own self. It's a, it's a hideous, and I, I'm speaking very uh, strongly about it, but I don't think I can speak strongly enough about it. It is a very, very, very bad idea. And we should be thankful as Adventists that it's not part of our heritage. Uh, and I think one reason it's a good idea to be an Adventist is not to have to carry this burden around. Now, I, I have a I have a question for the group. Is there anyone else in this group who has an experience like Donna's or like Forrest's in which there were people who uh, believed in eternal torment and it, it was a, a problem for them or, or not? I, I want to jump in if I can and say something. Okay. Is that okay? No, go for it then. 
Thank you. Because Donna mentioned Stalin and I grew up in a communist country. I grew up in Romania in a very traditional Adventist family. And the idea of heaven impacted my life because happiness was for heaven. Happiness was not for this life. It was selfish to be happy in this life. So imagine me coming to America who has a call for happiness. And uh, I was a little bit shocked and uh, it was, um, it was, it is still difficult to define happiness for myself. I have meaning in my life. I have joy. I do good things for others. But this image of the, and this understanding of heaven, this is how it impacted my life. And right now I work as a chaplain. So I want to share with you a story about one of my patients. She was uh, NPO. She wasn't eating for an, anything for seven days, but she was not dying. The family kept waiting for her to, to pass because she wasn't even drinking water. And I kept offering to go visit, but they kept saying, uh, oh, no, no, she's going to pass in a few hours. She's going to pass tonight. She's going to pass tomorrow morning. You don't have to come. Finally, seven days later, they say, yes, please come. And when I got there, I realized that the son who was the caregiver is a gay man married with married and they grew up in a very traditional environment and their understanding of heaven and hell impacted them the one of the two gay men uh, was abused in his church and was abused by his mother and he didn't want to have anything to do with the church or with faith or with god for that matter and the patient that was dying she was Southern Baptist, very traditional. And we figured out by talking and learning about her life that she was afraid to die because she was afraid she's going to hell. She was married three times and divorce was a capital sin in her faith community. And she was afraid to take her last breath because she didn't want to go to hell. And we talked about forgiveness. We talked about grace. Three hours later, she passed away. Mm. So this is how our understanding of heaven and hell can deeply, deeply impact our life. Thank you. Thank you, Forrest. Hey, thank you. Yeah, Eduardo has his hand up. David. Yes, go ahead, Eduardo. Uh, I remember a story by Sister Huay saying that when she came home, her mom told her, Helen, I, I hear the strange things of the church today, that there is no hell. And Helen said, Mother, if there is no hell, how are we are going to shake the conscience of the sinners? I think in then those times, and in many parents, that's the purpose of hell, to check the conscience of people or children. Well, 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 yes, and there are, there, are, there are many people who are reluctant to give up the idea of everlasting torment because they think that without that, people will um, descend into moral chaos. So the one thing that keeps us from, from uh, going into that pit of moral chaos is the idea that we might suffer everlastingly if we do. But that seems to me to be so much of a stretch because we know of whole civilizations that, to which this idea has not occurred, and they live civilized life, lives. What about all the Buddhist cultures, for instance? So um, I don't think that 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 particular one holds merit. Did you want to say more, Eduardo? No, I think that there are many ways to explain the, the purpose of teaching eternal hell. You know, I was uh, going to jump in here again, David, go back to my early days in my ministry when we did a lot of evangelism. And I'm telling you, people do not want to give up this concept of hell. It, they just hang on to it, they hang on to it, and they hang on to it. 
and it's just it just ingrained in so many people uh, and I think it's really damning to children uh, to uh, have them being taught uh, eternal hell so I uh, again you know we as Adventists here we come from a different perspective than the the audience or the readers of this book pri primarily to a lot of people this is going to be new news to them um, because they're going to say well the bible definitely teaches eternal punishing and that was one of the things we always distinguish the punishment is eternal in the sense it never is reversed but it but eternal hell is punishing forever and like our okay. chairman says you know you live to be 35 you have 35 years of sinning why should you be tortured for 30 billion years and that's just the beginning it it does not make sense yeah i agree Brahman, were you going to oh uh Brahman, were you going to say something no oh, okay jeff i think is next john yeah. has her hand up too uh who's up donna has her hand up oh okay <laughs> yeah um it seems i think it, to us eternal hell makes no sense or at least it's not compatible with the god of grace and love I'm uh, sorry, Jeff, could you pull your up closer to the mic now? Come closer, Bill. Sorry. I'm used to using a microphone attached to the head. Can you hear me now? <laughs> just barely. Yeah, I'm going to say barely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Just push Donna out of the way. <laughs> uh, we have, uh, you know, okay, so you heard the part that we're all comfortable with not having people suffer forever and ever, right? So then the uh, thing comes back that we Adventists have our own version, though, and that when we come, when the New Jerusalem comes down, then uh, God's, everybody's going to admit God's right, and then there's everybody that's bad is going to be destroyed. Those that were only a little bad will get only a little pain, and those that were really, really bad, particularly Satan, are going to suffer the longest. What do you do with that? I, I wonder if we have created God in our own image, uh, David, in terms of talking about, to, to tag on to what Jeff said, God kind of only able to be happy if he can hear the shrieks of the damned. Uh, Maybe the shrieks will eventually die out. Perhaps Lucifer's will never die out. He'll be the last one burning, so to speak. Uh, but we've imposed that on God, have we not? Now, let me ask uh, David, you, you, maybe you can answer this. Where does that doctrine come from? That is not a New Testament. Isn't that Ellen White? Uh, yes. Uh, well, let me let me, let me. Well, I think I hear Rick uh, real quickly. One does not find that idea in the Bible, right? And I don't think one finds it in Ellen White, but maybe one does. I don't remember. But clearly, the Adventists around her, I do know they did. And I think it was their attempt not to seem soft on sin. Uh, and so they wanted some kind of proportional retribution. But it, it seems to me a concession to a desire for retribution that is unworthy of us. I don't know if, Rick, were you going to say something? Apparently not. Okay. Uh, one, the way I'm comfortable with this is that God doesn't really kill anybody uh, unless they decide that they cannot live in his presence. And so the evil person thinks that they can do it We've been warned all our lives that reality is finally going to break through. And uh, God in heaven, there's no longer going to be a silent planet or a sequestered place where God is not anymore. But, uh, he's warning us that when his presence comes, uh, we need to be prepared and already have a relationship with him. If we don't have that relationship or, uh, or we keep denying it, then we're not prepared to be in the presence of God. 
Uh, but God doesn't reach out and say, okay, you're dead, bang, bang. What happens is the person decides, finally realizes that they cannot live in the presence of God. And that's why some are longer than others. But that's what Mrs. White said, and I think it's in the great controversy uh, when she's talking about the culminating, uh, the culmination of, uh, of this great controversy. Is that idea of proportional retribution in Alan White in the Great Controversy? I don't remember. I think so. Mm -hmm. Was that Eduardo? You said that? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> I think Dr. Capina was going to jump in, then Dr. Yeah. Taylor. I'm a third generation Adventist, and I grew up getting hammered that every bad deed and every good deed went to a, to a book. And that at the end of my life, I was going to be resurrected and I was going to be held accountable. And then a funny thing happened in my life. I went to psychiatry and learned about the brain. And now we have compelling evidence that everything we have is a function of our brain. We can duplicate uh, spirituality and religious, hyper-religiousness by triggering portions of our brain. So... I'm conflicted. Do I hold on to my to my legacy, or do I hold on to my newfound um, knowledge in neuroscience? And I mean, thinking of these things, will I be resurrect, uh, resurrected, and will have to account for all my bad thoughts and my good thoughts? You know. Well, you know, you know, Dr. Taylor. A lot of times, where our worst our own worst enemy that we're, we're much more conscious of, of any failings that we might have than anybody else. And I think we exaggerate it. A lot of times that has to do with the environment you're brought up in. Dr. Taylor wants to say something. <laughs> I'm sorry. I think um, Bernard was next. I, my mic just a is second, on. Bernard. I, I hate it when somebody makes a comment and it just drops uh, and it doesn't create anything. And I would want to respond to Dr. Capino and say, I think the ideal is to integrate the best of what you received with the best of what you learned and not to side one way or the other, but to, to be sifting and sorting from your Adventist heritage, but also to be sifting and sorting from your professional education and bring the best together uh, in a creative synthesis. Easier said than done. I guess that's called the dialectic process, right? Yep. Bernard. All right. Um, well, um, I never had a chance to uh, <laughs> say anything really, um, but uh, we listened um, last, um, we listened earlier in the when we were meeting in person to Sigler in those uh, six meetings, and uh, he distributed his book, and many people bought it. Um, I think if we would, I know that if we were to all work our way through that, we would find a connected, uh, true to the text response which indicates that we have grossly misunderstood the book of Revelation and through that, the picture of God. And um, by the time he has had the opportunity to present his case fully, I think he makes a, a convincing case that under no circumstances is God involved with uh, any act of killing at any time, that sin is self-destructive and will eventually take care of itself. And um, I would like the opportunity, uh, perhaps when we're back together, to talk at some length about what lies behind all of this, which is the constant, uh, uh, over a millennia now, of developing the notion of the, well, in the last 500 years, particularly uh, since Luther and the legal model 
but it goes back a long way further than that. And we have developed a whole myth of which the notion of suffering and death is the end of it, when in fact throughout it all and throughout uh, Sigvir's commentary, commentary on Revelation, God is a God of love, period. And uh, when we can grasp that, then there is no room for the notions that we have accepted over time and the notion of a divine law and about this ultimate working it all out and that there is some system to which God himself is subject which prevents his choosing a different sort of action he sort of just has to play along with it all along the way and uh, it's time that this was laid to rest it's centuries so many people have suffered through it and have not been able to find the God of love who is the one who is actually behind and through it and above all. And in just three words, we describe love, uh, describe God. God is love, period. Forrest, who's next? I uh, thought, did I, Karen, I, did you have your hand Karen, up? Karen was going to build right on uh, Bernard's comment, I think. I... I want to affirm that in the strongest possible terms. Okay. But why do people resist it? It's, it's, you'd think that that idea that God is not punitive in the least would be good news, but many people, many Adventists resist it intensely. Well, one of the reasons is that um, to combine the two, my working definition of righteousness by works is working like hell to get to heaven. <laughs> On my teeth. So this is McKinley. <laughs> Dave, may I? Sure. Oh, yes. So um, as this is a spiritual uh, battle, let's also not forget the role of the enemy in trying to distort God's character and how susceptible many Christians are to, um, uh, or I should say vulnerable to, uh, to the, the work of, of Satan. Um, so that's one comment. But I think the other uh, comment I want to make is again calling from, I believe is uh, Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, where God, where the Bible talks about consummate understanding uh, as getting to a point in your walk with God where you understand his character to be one um, who exercises loving kindness, righteousness, and judgment uh, throughout the earth. The other point about um, um, uh, death and the end, uh, the end as the revelation talks about it, is that Jesus, uh, when he talks about um, uh, the, the final punishment uh, for sin, he talks about it in terms of um, it being a punishment for the devil and his angels. I don't think scripture <laughs> talks about um, God punishing people or exercising retribution against humanity. What the scripture teaches is that um, God's whole purpose and his mission is to save people, is to save lives. And that's the picture of God that I get out of the Bible. And I think that's the picture of hope that Revelation talks about. Say one more thing here. I want to thank Dana for uh, her story. Last week we talked about what other ways the Adventist church and Adventist Christians can engage the world more. It pains me every time when we talk about the wonderful message and and uh, blessings of scripture uh, as we experience it in this Adventist community. And yet we're amongst a lot of people who um, don't have the benefit of these understandings and therefore struggle with some of the things that we've talked about, you know, the fear of dying. Um, what more can the Adventist church do? And what more can we as Adventist Christians do to share this hope with other people. I think we fail many times as we hear these stories of people being tortured. 
you know, by this lack of understanding who God is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. David, can you hear me? Um, I can hear you, but I can't see you. Who, who yeah, speaking? I don't know why I can't make myself visible. It's David <laughs> Franklin from uh, North Carolina. I'm okay, invisible. Okay, good to see you, David. Away. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we've been, we've been uh, following you folks on and off uh, since we've been here and enjoy it. I just thought, I know it's a little past the point, but I got to thinking, you know, uh, I wanted to see if I could find the reference in Ellen White's writings about some people suffering longer before they're, shall we say, annihilated. And I found that, or actually um, Janine and I, she found it online and I just about spotted it in the book, but it's chapter 42 in Great Controversy. And if I may be allowed, I'll read a few sentences. Yes, please. You'll find it interesting. And she's talking about the wicked. And she says, um, and after quoting Malachi 4.1, she says, Some are destroyed as in a moment, while others suffer many days. All are punished, quote, according to their deeds, unquote. The sins of the righteous having been transferred to Satan, he is made to suffer not only for his own rebellion, but for all the sins which he has caused God's people to commit. And there, undoubtedly, she has reference to the scapegoat going on. His punishment is to be far greater than that of those whom he has deceived. That's basically it. Well, I'm thankful for the, for the citation because I did not recall it. Um, and get forced to jump in here as well. The, you know, this raises all the questions about how to interpret Ellen White. Uh, and one principle of interpretation would be that we emphasize things that she repeatedly said and not things that she occasionally said. And I, I don't want to use that to be dismissive of what she said. I, the fact that she says that suggests to me that I need to take the issue very, very seriously and not be dismissive of it, but think carefully about this idea of proportional retribution, because she, at least in that passage, doesn't want to give it up. But it's, it's, um, it's not, I think it's fair to say it's not a frequent theme in her writings, and therefore we need to, to uh, look at it pretty, pretty closely. I, I would like to respond here. You know, well, first of all, there's another issue of, of, of judgment being uh, more uh, measured, and that's origin. In the second century, he believed in reincarnation. And he believed that people would go out, they'd die, and then they would come back. And finally, they could get saved because of their, all their sins were were purged. Uh, but the other part of it is, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to rain on this parade, but you know, you look at the Bible and we say God is love, and I want to believe that. But I think, David, a few weeks ago, you mentioned that all the times the plagues are put out, God puts them out. And you go to the book of Revelation, and it's God throwing fire down. Uh, you know, my, my attitude is if God's character needs to be uh, re rehabilitated, what role does God have to have in this? So we just can't throw out some of these things from the Bible uh, just casually. And I don't think you are. I'm just saying is that's a struggle that I have uh, with these passages from the scripture. David. Yeah, it bored him. David, I remember two more uh, occasions when she speak about proportional punishment. Okay. She, she said that in the flood, the wickedness was punished according to proportions. And today the nations are punished according to the light they have rejected. Mm -hmm. So there is two more instances when she mentioned that. Okay, thank you. Uh, you know, that means uh, I don't feel that abound to 
believe everything Ellen White did, I do feel bound to study very carefully what she said. And if I do disagree with her, know why I'm doing so. It, the fact that she says this makes it imperative upon me to consider very carefully. Now back to Forrest's point. Yeah, um, we simply do not believe that COVID-19 came from God though I don't doubt that some of the ancients in the First Testament would have talked about it that way. And someday we need to ask ourselves why it is that we don't say what they said. Uh, but we also need to concede that some people do say that uh, now. So, but I think this is, for me, this is where we have to get into uh, the idea that our beliefs are based not only on Scripture, but on other things as well. Uh, and science has persuaded us that we know that God did not directly, directly do this. Um, so the contribution of science helps us here. And I don't want to let science be a veto over scripture. On the other hand, I don't think science can be totally um, ignored when we think about these matters. Uh, oh, uh, uh, Juan. You're, you're muted, Juan. Okay. Um, I would like and to... And Rodney. Okay. Uh, I will, if you allow me, I would like to go back uh, to what Dr. Taylor has uh, very nicely explained uh, as far as God is love by definition. And that uh, really uh, sin will take care of itself, and it's not that God will be punished, but it's just the consequence of sin. I do feel comfortable with this. I do like this. I enjoy this idea. It, it, it feels good, and I have not only nothing against it, but I embrace it. However, as a common believer, as a person on the pew, as a not really deep knowledge of theology, we go through the Bible and through all our rearing uh, in the Christian faith with the idea of always to be saved to salvation. So I think the paradigm in typically in the religion is just the opposite. So we are lost to start with. We are drowning. We are, uh, you know, going down and, and we have to save. I mean, the, Using the word safe and salvation, that we are in the opposite situation. And, and there is either by the grace of God or by our words or whatever to be saved. So, in other words, instead of starting the story that God is our friend and God is love, and really, really, we have to be against Him to get lost, uh, the, the story in Christianity is that we are lost. And something needs to be done to be safe. So this is the way we, we, we preach the message, the way that we uh, are indoctrinated is that we are lost. Uh, we're drowning and something needs to be done to be safe. And this is a paradigm that is, in a way, the antithesis of, I wouldn't say the opposite, but I mean, it's a different way to start the story that God is love, even though uh, I like this very much. Rodney? Well, let me, let me see if I understand what Juan said. Are you saying that we need to hear, we need to be aware of our, um, our lostness before we start talking about divine love? Do I understand that correctly? I'm just saying that for many, it's difficult to reach the conclusion that God is love uh, when we start from the negative, that we are lost. Oh, so I just, uh, it was just the opposite of what I said. Right. I, I, I misunderstood. I'm glad I sought clarification because I missed what you said by 180 degrees. Yeah, thank you. I agree with you entirely. Um, and you see, all we have to work with are human models, human situations. And we have some favorites and evangelical Christianity has opted on the legal model and that is without that um, there can't be so there are hundreds of them 
but none of them is is the truth nor all of them combined and so because we have started we need to change our story uh, or rethink our situation and um and this is where the the negative picture comes and uh, when we have a picture of a friend then we have all of these negatives that we're not worthy of it but god has has uh, shown his love and i appreciate the comments uh, that have been made and uh, dave i think you were a, a key part of this as well in relationship to the old testament in the old testament god was willing to meet the people where they were and this is one of the things that has really changed my perspective in uh, my picture of the events of the old testament and the class has had the benefits of fritz guy and brian bull's presentation that there are only two explanatives to use their term there it was um it, well everything was was basically up to god and god for the in the meantime says i accept that we will live with that then he sent his son and everything changed so um yeah there, there's there's a lot behind this and and uh, we have many subjects in class that uh, we will continue to work through and and we have the opportunity to come to continue to come to an increased understanding yes thank you uh for us who do you know i'm gonna say karen uh, has her hand up thank you i wanted to start um briefly by going all the way back to uh, david larson your question of why do people struggle to accept uh or to let go of the doctrine of hell one piece of that puzzle that I can contribute is uh, I've known many legalists who've tried very hard and they cannot let go of the doctrine of hell because there's a tremendous grieving process for them that they've wasted their life being a, such a perfect legalist and now you're telling them none of that mattered very hard to find out that you gave up a lot and performed and it never mattered i think they hang on to that paradigm to make their life meaningful mm -hmm. and then i had another comment go ahead okay, well, go ahead i really am sorry and i am looking forward to the day uh when adventism i think will uh if she ever does, um, tell her true calling. Through all my life, uh, we've given Revelation seminars and these 27 meeting series, and they're always about uh, the Sabbath and uh, vegetarianism and the state of the dead and uh, Revelation and Daniel and I guess is what I'm trying to say. What I think we have to contribute is the picture of God that Jeff, that Bernard Taylor mentioned, that Dr. Sabaté mentioned. This is our gift to the world that Dana, you know, the chaplain, was able to share with her patient at the end. Uh, this is what we have to tell, this story of that God is our friend and back it up with the way we understand the Bible. Uh, yeah, I think that's very important that that Adventists uh, continue to share uh, that there, I don't want to say just that there's no eternal torment, just it, it just does bring a lot of relief to people when they finally learn it. So, uh, but you're right, a lot of people just don't want to buy into it. It's impossible. I think Rodney was next, maybe. Yeah, I'd just like to make a, a couple of observations. Uh, today's um, session was going to be on, on heaven and how, and we spent our time exclusively talking about how, which uh, in my background is uh, an Adventist proclivity. 
uh, and uh, just noticing uh, my endeavors in trying to find a, uh, uh, an Adventist uh, theology to step back into and reading Spectrum magazine, the amount of comments that I've read from people that felt uh, in their uh, Adventist experience and leaving the church, uh, it, they just got saturated with uh, discussions in church on Satan, devil, the how and fear-based religion, and it just burnt them out and, and they moved to the sidelines. So uh, um, I, I think we as Adventists have to have to give serious thought to, I guess it still comes back in my mind, to the picture of God, but even uh, proportional punishment I see as an anathema to the God that I'm trying to believe, trying to understand and would like to follow. Um, I think the other part uh, is that in uh, trying to explore all religions, I've yet to come across a religion or find a religion that doesn't have justice as part of its four pillars. And so um, I think deeply embedded in me and, and virtually all people is, is, is this issue of justice. So I find that I can't have a, a rich discussion about love without talking about mercy. I can't have a rich discussion about mercy without getting back to justice. There has to be some accountability. And so my pretty singular focused disappointment in Sigbe was actually illuminated by you and one other presenter uh, um, at that uh, afternoon event is what does Zigbe say about justice? Is there no justice? Um, I'm not one that's big on retribution, uh, but there has to be some accountability uh, and it doesn't have to be the, in the form of any eternal punishment uh, and, and, and certainly not proportional, necessarily proportional punishment. Uh, I'm not asking for that but I am asking um, for clarity on this issue of justice uh, that the previous speaker uh, person also uh, 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 referred to. And, and as I struggle to put a theology together is um, I can't step around that. Uh, is somebody has to help me construct that uh, because um, I think it's a central point of any and every religion I've looked at. And so am I being asked to just ignore it? I don't think I can, at least not right now. Well, uh, I'll respond real quickly. Uh, we can't ignore it because it's a deep, deep primordial intuition. That's right. And if we try to ignore it, we will fail and be worse off. So we need, we need to address it. I think when we do so, we'll ask about the different ways the word justice has been understood over time and that there may be some ways of understanding it that are more helpful than others. I think that's the direction we would probably go, but we, um, we cannot just ignore it because this is something, there's something deep in the human psyche that longs for accountability and that accountability will have consequences. We say that to our children, right? your choices will have consequences. And then to have choices with no consequences, that is, um, that's, that's a problem. So yeah, we need to talk about that more. Uh, Horace, do you know who's next? Uh, I, I'm trying to, I think Ladon, I think you're next. Thank you. Um, I think there is a, I listened to the, the videos that you had sent and um, my, um, my feeling is that there is a little bit of humility is in order. We always have to try to make sense about what um, our faith, what our community, all of these, what, are they, what do we stand for? What are these meanings? And I think... We have, we have tried to come up with stories that make sense. And as we look at ourselves, I mean, I'm talking for me, and I'm looking at uh, myself, my sense of justice as I was younger and more confident about my story and my picture was that I belong to the good people and the bad people need to be punished. And as I go through life and look at me and I'm looking at myself and 
realizing that I need to forgive myself for my own mistakes and understandings. My story of God is changing. And as I study more about governments and police and the power that we give to the punishers and executioners and, and our righteousness, um, I feel more uh, confused and humbled about the stories. I think here at what Ehrman is talking about, I think we need to be a bit more humble. We have tried to make sense of this world. And some people without the idea of heaven and hell have come up with a meaningful life regardless of what happens. And they have made their lives meaningful and useful here. Um, I think the idea, I come from a very diverse religious background and um, the stories are not comforting anymore to me that I belong to the good guys that the ideas that Christianity offers a good story, it's not anymore because other people have good stories too. My faith is good, my community is good, but it's as good as any other community that is just and tries to make people live together in harmony. I think I would like to be more humble about, about my story anymore, about my story of whatever, I come up with that makes sense. Um, and it doesn't mean that it's true. My story doesn't, isn't any more true than a, a, a Sufi story or a Muslim story or a Baha'i story. Why? Why is our story better? Um, God is the God that approaches everyone. And the story of God that says, uh, you work all day in the field and the guy who just came on and gives them the same thing. Why does that make sense? It doesn't. It's not just to us. Uh, so why is uh, the story of Job? Is God, does he have a background story that we don't know? And we can, I'm just saying, let's, let's just not hang on to what we think is the truth because it may not be. Sorry. Hey. You believe the Bible? Okay, but that doesn't mean it is. Okay. Yeah, but I, I think that counsel of humility is, is really, really, really important. Now, I see Catherine's hand, and then I see John's hand. Catherine? Okay, so I had two comments. One, in terms of justice. I'm giving you an example I don't really understand very well, but I know that the concept of restorative justice has been more popular, and I tend to have a visceral, my, my first impression when I heard that term was a visceral reaction of, wait, that's not fair, but the, the point of restorative justice seems to be to bring the gender back into community, to make, re um, to make rest, uh, to rest, you know, uh, what I'm looking for. I'm not retribution. Restoration. Catherine, I'm having trouble hearing you. Can you get oh, close? I'm sorry. Let me try uh, a little louder. So the idea of restorative justice, um, which I don't understand very well, but I think that the, the offender needs to make restitution and um, become, again, united with the community, not necessarily united with the victim if that's not safe, but to the justice would be more of a communal and a restorative process rather than um, just a punishment process. And I mm -hmm. think so mm -hmm. that's a different model. And I think the other model would be in terms of where you start. Um, having had experience with um, campus evangelism programs, they always start with trying to convince somebody that they're really bad and terrible. And then eventually, hopefully, you get to good news at the end if, if the person hasn't walked away by them, which you would kind of think would be kind of a, um, an occupational hazard of that kind of approach. But I think back when I was Lutheran, it was much different, or the, the different denominations I've been that have had infant baptism, it's, you know, which has its own problems, but there the focus is, it is more, you're bringing somebody into community and growing and developing them, and it's, and, you know, God loves them from the start, and it's a very different model from the, oh, you're terrible, but wait, God loves you anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so if justice is not merely retribution, 
then what else is it? And that's what we need to explore. Uh, and we need to remember that the ancients in Hebrew times longed for God's judgment. They wanted to be judged by God. So their view of the judgment was a little different from ours. They, they were looking forward to being judged by God, whereas a lot of us feel a little anxious about being judged by God. So that suggests that justice has more than one, one uh, connotation to 